So in this video, I will look at the positions United need to improve upon, the sorts of players United need, the system they should look to play, and the players that should be sold in order to finance a summer spend. So before we look at the individual players, what will Manchester United look like come the end of the season? Well, United should be looking to build a squad for the Champions League next season, presumably. It doesn't currently look like Manchester City will be involved unless they manage to appeal and the ban is suspended. But even still, let's assume United do get Champions League football as they currently are fifth and do look like they should be able to finish in the top five come the end of the season. But even still, I think the transfers I am proposing will still be able to be pulled off, even with the uncertainty around the Champions League. Straight off the bat, United need to solve the Paul Pogba issue. Is he staying and signing a new contract or is he being sold early in the window? There is no point keeping him at the club if he isn't signing a contract extension, as this will mean that next summer he'll only have one year left on his contract, which will dramatically reduce a transfer fee United can recoup by selling him, which will ultimately leave them with less money to reinvest in the squad. Personally, I do not think Pogba will sign a contract extension, so United should look to offload him for a fee in the region of £100 million, which I do think is attainable, particularly if Real Madrid's interest remains strong. Matic, whilst hitting a decent run of form since coming back into the side, has been underwhelming, looking slow and predictable over the past year or so. And with him turning 32 in August and his contract expiring at the end of the season, Solskjaer should take this chance to get him off the wage bill. Phil Jones, Marcus Rojo and Andreas Pereira should also be shifted out of the squad. United probably won't get a fee for them, but getting them out on loan would take their big wages off of the budget. Luke Shaw could bring in around 20 million, Lingard around 10 million, Chris Smalling could be sold for 15 million with his good season at Roma, increasing his value, and United could potentially bring in around 30 million pounds for Dean Henderson, who is currently on loan at Sheffield United, but is attracting interest from other English clubs. This means that United could raise around £175 million in player sales, which with a net budget of around £100 million, which is feasible, would give Solskjaer a total budget of around £275 million to spend. But what should United look to be doing in this transfer window? Well, it seems that Solskjaer will remain at the club for next season, so I will assume that for this series of videos. The key players in the side at the moment are Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford, excluding Paul Pogba. Some would argue that Anthony Martial as well, but I think that Fernandes and Rashford are a lot more consistent, hence why I would build a side to bring out the best in their strengths. Solskjaer likes to use a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-4-2 diamond, and these will be the two systems I would look to build a squad around. There would be no point in suggesting players to fit into a 4-4-2 or a 4-3-3 if the manager isn't going to be using those systems. Therefore, I'm going to be imagining myself as a director of football, bringing in players for Solskjaer to use. So where do United need to improve? I think that even though Luke Shaw is a decent left back and is very good defensively, which is why he excels when playing as a left-sided centre-back in a back five, I don't think he is good enough going forward, which does hinder United's offensive system. Brandon Williams isn't yet ready to be a starter, so I think that next season he would be the backup left back. United need a left back who's a very good dribbler and has great end product in the final third. This is because Wamba Sakura on the other side lacks these attributes and should be played as a defensive minded fullback because of his world class one on one defending ability. This does mean that United need some more attacking output from the left back to make up for this, which is why I would choose an individual who can fit this bill. With Bruno Fernandes playing ahead of a double pivot in midfield, which at the moment would consist of Fred and McTominay, I think there could be a significant improvement. If Matic were to be let go and Pogba sold, United would probably need to bring in at least two central midfielders just for depth, if nothing else. But still, United should be looking to improve upon Fred and McTominay if they want to push towards the title in the next few years, as when you look at Manchester City and Liverpool, not only do they have a strong starting eleven, but also quality in depth, which United currently lack. Therefore, I will be suggesting a deep line playmaker who has the passing ability to solve United's issues with advancing the ball into the forward lines when playing against a deep defensive unit. Whether this comes from a long pass or being able to play low incisive passes into players between the lines. As we can see from this image, if United had a central midfielder who could make the pass into Mata, then he would be able to receive the ball in behind the opposition's midfield. This would vastly improve United's offensive play, as while McTominay and Fred are very good industrious midfielders, they lack this sort of passing ability. Both central midfielders need to be good defensively, i.e. have good reading of the game, being good tacklers, and having good athleticism to assert a press from the centre of midfield. 
I will also suggest a more ball winner type of midfielder who can bring a world class defensive ability from the centre of midfield which combined with a deep line playmaker would make United's midfield not only high quality but balanced as well. United need a right winger to play in the three behind the main striker as matter is too slow and not of the quality that United need. Daniel James while showing quality in spurts is nowhere near a first team regular for a title contender at the moment and is more of an impact sub and being able to start maybe 15 to 20 games in a season. A wide midfielder who can stretch the pitch on the right and provide a dribbling threat is essential with this being the weakest part of Wambasaka's game. In this sense a right winger in a 4-2-3-1 will be more of a winger type than Rashford on the left who will look to move more into central zones. Good short passing and intricate ball control will allow the right winger to link well with players like Fernandes and Martial around the box and will also give them versatility which is needed when Solskjaer moves to a 4-4-2 diamond shape. For this sort of system it would be valuable if the right winger could also play in behind two centre forwards or in the front two himself. Even though Anthony Martial does look like he has the potential to be a top class striker, I do think that United should look to bring in a player who can lead the line in a 4-2-3-1 or play in a front two. This is because Martial does show inconsistency not just throughout a season but throughout matches. In some games whilst having that bit of quality that can win a game, he can also go 60 or 70 minutes without being able to link the attack effectively and lacking the quality that the likes of Harry Kane or Olivier Giroud have outside of the box. So if United could find a striker to use as a focal point instead of Martial in some games, then I would look to bring him in to also add depth to that position. Teo Hernandez, the left back that Manchester United should sign. Episode 2 of 6. So the player I would look to bring in is Teo Hernandez from AC Milan, who would probably cost around £40 million to sign after he moved to Milan from Real Madrid in the summer for £20 million. Teo is 22, 23 in October and stands at 6 foot tall. As I specified in the first episode of this series which you can find in the eye above, United need to look for a left back who is an excellent offensive fullback in terms of their ability to progress the ball forward down the flanks through their dribbling. They also need to have the offensive output of a winger to provide a threat from those wide positions, with wan on the opposite side likely sitting slightly deeper and being more conservative with his movements forward, as he's a much better defensive fullback than an offensive one. This should give the left back a greater authority to motor forward and therefore United's priority should be finding a left back who can bring these assets. I consider Teo Hernandez along with Alejandro Grimaldo and Alex Tellez, however I think Teo's pace, athleticism and dribbling ability gives him the edge over the other two. We can see just how good Teo Hernandez is when we look at him from a statistical perspective. He has completed the second most dribbles of any left back in Syria with 2 per 90 minutes. This is almost as many as Marcus Rashford who completed 2.1 per 90 minutes playing as a left winger, showing just how good a dribbler Teo is for a left back. Teo Hernandez's attacking output is also impressive, he has completed 1.3 key passes per 90 minutes which is a joint 6th most of any left back in Serie A. To put this into perspective, Benjamin Mendy at Manchester City has also completed 1.3 dribbles per 90 minutes, showing that Hernandez is amongst one of the best attacking fullbacks when it comes to being able to create chances. Despite being a fantastic offensive fullback, Teo also has the defensive attributes to match. He is very good at defending in one-on-one -on -one situations, which can be seen with him only being dribbled past 0.8 times per 90 minutes, whilst completing 2.6 tackles per 90 minutes as well. Luke Shaw, who is a pretty good one-on-one -on -one defender, has only been dribbled past 0.9 times per 90 minutes in the Premier League, whilst completing 2.9 tackles per game, which is a similar ratio to Teo's. Teo is just as good as Luke Shaw in terms of his one-on-one -on -one defending and positional play, but his incredible athleticism and offensive output makes him a superior fullback to the Englishman. So how would Teo Hernandez fit into Solskjaer's system? Well in Solskjaer's preferred 4-2-3-1 shape, Teo would work well on the left side with Rashford ahead of him. With Rashford playing as an inside forward, he will naturally look to move inside into narrow positions, in behind the opposition's midfield, or make diagonal runs into goal scoring positions. This would inevitably draw the opposition's fullback inside into a narrow position and leave space on the flank for Teo to overlap into. Teo's dribbling would also vastly improve United's ability to progress the ball forward into the final third. Ball progression relies on either the ability of the team to play incisive passes into players between the lines or having players who can dribble past the opposition and therefore move the ball forward and the latter is something that Teo can add to United's arsenal as currently the only real top quality ball carriers in the side are Marcus Rashford and Paul Pogba so having someone who can do this from deep areas as Teo can will be of huge benefit. 
When Teo gets into advanced positions, he has the quality to deliver across from deep, make an off the ball run down the channel towards the byline before putting a ball across the box or cutting it back to the edge of the box, or he can isolate the fullback in a one-on-one -on -one situation before going past them as a traditional winger would. This winger-like ability would make him perfectly suited to playing the left back row in a 4-4-2 diamond, where there is no other wide player on the left flank, leaving the left back to produce the so offensive output. Also in a 5-3-2 shape, which Solskjaer likes to deploy, against possession dominant size, using a counter-attacking style, the AC Milan man would be capable of playing the wing-back role, providing the athleticism needed when playing as a multifunctional wide player. So overall, Teo Hernandez's offensive ability in terms of his athleticism, dribbling and chance-creating ability via his crossing, is a main reason for him being my number one target for United at left-back. He's one of the best young fullbacks in the world at the moment, both offensively and defensively, would be an immediate attacking upgrade from Luke Shaw, adding a different dimension to United's left side of the attack, and at just 22, £40 million represents excellent value for a player who could become the best left back in the world over the next couple of years. Why Manchester United should sign Wilfred and Didi, episode 3 of 6. So as I specified in the first episode of this series, which will be linked in the eye above, I would look to sign a deep line playmaker alongside a ball winning midfielder to play as a double pivot in midfield. The ball winning midfielder that I would sign would be Leicester City's Wilfred Ndidi. Many may think, why would Ndidi leave Leicester, who look like they will be in the Champions League next season, for a Manchester United side who have been nowhere near as good as Brendan Rodgers' side this season? I would agree that it won't be easy to firstly convince Ndidi to join and then convince Leicester to sell, however we have seen it done before with N'Golo Kante, leaving Leicester after their title win in 2016 and if we look at the long term point of view, over the next few seasons Manchester United are more likely to be competing for the title than Leicester City will be. I do think that United will have to open their pockets to prize him away from the King Power Stadium and I think it would cost around £65 million to do that. Whilst this is a lot of money to spend on a defensive minded midfielder, I think that this would represent excellent value. And Didi just turned 23 in December, so has an excellent age profile for a central midfielder, and has consistently been one of the best defensive midfielders not just in the Premier League, but in Europe over the past few seasons. We can see just how good he is when we analyse him from a statistical perspective. The main purpose of a ball winning, defensive minded midfielder is to break up the play and win the ball back off the opposition, so tackling ability is obviously the key attribute needed. The ability to read the game and make interceptions is also vital, as with a player who is an exceptional interceptor, a side's pressing system can go from good to extremely effective. With Ndidi this is where he excels. This season he has completed the second most tackles in the Premier League with 4 tackles per game, and the second most interceptions in the league with 2.7 per game. This is not just one great season for him either, he consistently has been putting up these sorts of defensive numbers as seen with last season he made the second most tackles in the league with 3.8 per game showing that he's probably the best and most consistent ball winner in the Premier League. The argument against this statistic may be that even though he's winning the ball a lot more, maybe he's having more opportunity to do so than other central midfielders and in fact he's being dribbled past quite a lot. However, this season he has only been dribbled past 1.5 times per game, which means he has broken up the play over 2.5 times as many times as he's been dribbled past, which is extremely impressive, especially for a central midfielder, as this is the area where there is the most space to cover. As I said earlier on, he is a ball winner, not a deep line playmaker, which is evident as if he has a particular weakness, it would be his ability to create from deep areas. Whilst he is very good at switching the play from side to side with a long pass, he doesn't have the same ability as Ruben Neves or Yuri Tielemans to create a chance via a long pass over or through the opposition's back line. This is why I would have him paired alongside a more creative player who can perform this task more effectively. So how would Ndidi fit into Solskjaer's system? Well in Solskjaer's 4-2-3-1 system Ndidi would fit in seamlessly alongside either Fred or McTominay or a new sign-in, with Bruno Fernandes in front of them. Whilst McTominay and Fred are decent ball winning midfielders themselves, with Fred really excelling in the last few months, and Didi would be another level above them. Fred is very good at reading the game and being able to anticipate passes into central midfielders and being aggressive and quick enough to fly in and win the ball back high up the pitch, which suits Solskjaer's high pressing system. However, when the opposition bypass United's press and Fred is confronted with a one-on-one, -on -one, he isn't as good as Ndidi is at holding up the player and making a well-timed tackle, which can be seen as Fred has been dribbled past three times per game this season, which is double that of Ndidi's, with the Leicester man also completing nearly double the amount of tackles as the Brazilian. 
This clearly shows that Ndidi would improve the United midfield's ability to win the ball back, which whilst having the obvious defensive value, would also allow United to sustain attacks, with Ndidi being able to win the ball high up the pitch, keeping the opposition pinned in. Ndidi does play as the deepest midfielder in a single pivot in Leicester's 4-3-3 shape. He plays the role of an anchor man in the system, recycling the ball efficiently from that deep position and leaving the more creative aspects up to Tielemans and Madison. He isn't technically insufficient by any means. He has very good tight ball control which allows him to turn out of an aggressive press, which is an excellent attribute to have when playing in a deep midfield position, in a side that likes to play out from the back. And Didi could play this role in either a 4-4-2 diamond or a 4-3-3 shape for Solskjaer. In the 4-4-2 diamond, Fred and McTominay could be used as the wide central midfielders, either side of Ndidi. Ndidi would be the perfect player to sit behind the ball when United have possession, positioning himself so that he can break up potential counter-attacks. With Teo Hernandez playing at left back, who was the first player I suggested United sign, that video will be linked in the eye above and in the description below, and Didi could be used in this role, as when Teo advances forward, Playing almost as a left winger at times, Ndidi can use his athleticism and defensive capabilities to be the player who stops the counter-attacks down United's left channel. So overall, Ndidi is one of the best ball winning central midfielders in Europe, whilst also being a very capable possession player. He is still just 23, which makes his hefty price tag a lot more appealing. Why Manchester United should sign Ruben Neves, the Premier League's best deep line playmaker. So as I have talked about in prior episodes of this series, I think United should target two central midfielders, one being a ball winner and one being a playmaker. Wilfred Ndidi was a ball winning central midfielder that I chose and you can watch the video analysing why I chose him after this, it will be linked in the description below. So with that, the creative playmaker to play alongside Ndidi I would sign would be Wolves' is Ruben Nevers. Nevers has only just turned 23, so it's a fantastic age for United to recruit him. He would probably cost around 75 million, with his stock being very high and Wolves in no need to sell one of their top performers. However, despite this cost, I think Nevers would be worth every penny. Nevers' best attribute is his long passing ability. He can pick the ball up in a deep area and with one pass switch the attack out wide into an advanced position, in quarterback like fashion. For Wolves, this asset is vital to their attack in play, as they primarily look to transition the attack quickly and therefore are reliant on players like Yota and Jimenez making runs in behind the back line and having players in deep areas who can play these passes. This was evident against Leicester last season. When Wolves won the ball back deep in their own half, Neves would be the man to play those long passes over the back line to release the Wolves forwards, which was where Wolves' third and fourth goals came from. This shows that having a central midfielder who can play these sorts of passes can add a completely different dimension to a team's attack. When we look at United's current set of central midfielders, we can see the improvement Neves would bring. As I said in my first episode of this series, I think they should look to sell Pogba in the summer, even though the Frenchman does have this same long passing ability as Neves does and could play a deep line playmaker role. Fred is United's best central midfielder assuming Pogba leaves, but he isn't a deep line creator, he's more of a ball winner or a box to box midfielder depending on the system. As I said in my Wilfred and Didi video, Fred is a very good pressing central midfielder and is good at circulating possession efficiently, so he could play alongside Neves if Ndidi was out. We can clearly see Neves' long passing ability when we take an analytical view. In the Premier League this season, he has completed the second most long passes of any central midfielder with 5.7 per game, as well as ranking second for this stat last season as well. This is more than Fred who still ranks pretty highly in sixth with 4.6 per game, and a lot higher than McTominay who has recorded 2.1 per game and Matic who has 2.4 per game. Therefore, just putting Nevers in the United midfield with no other signings would improve United's ability to create chances, both against sides who leave space in behind their back line and against deeper defensive units. Nevers perfectly suits a possession based system, as seen as he's only had 0.5 unsuccessful touches per game, which is the second least of any central midfielder in the league, whereas Matic has had one unsuccessful touch per game, Fred has recorded 1.8 per game, and McTominay 1.9 per game. Nevers would therefore bring a greater press resistance to the United midfield, improving their ability to play out of an aggressive press. At the moment, Nevers isn't a better defensive midfielder than what United have got, 
We can see this as he doesn't make a huge amount of tackles. He's completed 1.7 per game, but been dribbled past 1.4 times per game. Whereas Matic has completed 2.2 per game and has only been dribbled past 1.2 times per game. I'd say Nevers and Fred are similar defensively. They are both well suited to playing in a double pivot, knowing when to push up and apply the pressure to the opposition's midfield. Both are not great when faced with one-on-ones in the middle of the pitch, which is seen as Fred has been dribbled past three times per game this season. This is why I would bring in Wilfred and Didi to partner either Neves or Fred, as Ndidi is by far the best ball winner in the league, which would give balance to the United midfield. Obviously we all know Neves' long range shooting ability is something unique, which is another valuable weapon to add to United's arsenal and could prove significant in games where they struggle to break down deep defensive units. So how would Neves fit into Solskjaer's system? But with the three signings I've already talked about making, Teo Hernandez, Wilfred Ndidi and Ruben Neves, the side would be set up like this in Solskjaer's preferred 4-2-3-1 shape. Neves and Ndidi would sit as a midfield double pivot. As I spoke about in my video on Teo Hernandez, which should appear in the eye above, Solskjaer should use an asymmetric back four in position, with Teo pushing forward like a left winger when Rashford moves in field, whilst wan on the other side will keep a more reserved position, still pushing forward but not as continuously as Teo, who is a much better attacking fullback. I would use Ndidi on the left side of the pivot, as he has the necessary athleticism and defensive attributes to fill that space if the opposition look to attack down there when Teo is upfield. Neves on the right side wouldn't have this sort of defensive responsibility, with wan not leaving as much space behind him going forward and being a world-class one-on-one defender. Neves is accustomed to playing in a two-man midfield, as he has done for Wolves in their 5-2-3 shape. So his positional play in this sort of shape is very good, and he should create an excellent pressing midfield alongside Ndidi. In possession, Neves will play the role of the deep-line playmaker in the side tasked with receiving the ball from the centre-backs and using his world-class passing ability to advance the attack into dangerous positions. With the likes of Martial and Rashford looking to make runs in behind the opposition's backline frequently, Neves' passing could be United's key weapon, making their counter-attack even more lethal and giving them the ability to switch the ball out to the wide attackers in a matter of seconds, something that we used to see Paul Scholes do multiple times throughout a game when he played alongside Michael Carrick. So with Neves just 23, solving United's biggest issues in midfield, I think he'd be the perfect signing for Solskjaer. Why Manchester United should sign Jadon Sancho, a future Ballon d'Or winner. Episode 5 of 6, United need a right winger who can play on the right side of the three in behind the centre forward, when Solskjaer uses a 4-2-3-1 shape, whilst also having the versatility to be used in a 5-3-2 or a 4-4-2 diamond as a central player, either behind the front two or in the front two himself. The player that I would sign would be Jadon Sancho from Borussia Dortmund, who has just turned 20. The fee quoted in the media to sign Sancho has been around £120 million. However, I think United could sign him for around £100 million, as he only has two years left on his contract, so Dortmund will want to cash in on him this summer, which would reduce his price a little, as next summer his value will drop significantly, with just one year remaining on his contract. Jadon Sancho's key attributes are his close control dribbling, interplay around the box, his vision and his weight of pass. This makes him an excellent wide player in a 4-2-3-1, as he has an attacking midfielder, a central midfielder and a right back all in close proximity in the attack, which suits his style of play. Wide players like Leroy Sané and Adama Traore are better suited when their teammates are further away from them, as this drags opposition players away from them when they are on the ball and this enables them to isolate one particular player, most likely the fullback in a one-on-one -on -one situation, from where they can use their electric pace to go past them. Sancho's close control dribbling and excellent interplay means that when teammates are close to him, he can play short passes with them or intricately go past the opposition players. Sancho's dribbling can be seen as he's completed the 7th most dribbles in the Bundesliga this season with 2.6 per game. He also has the 4th highest expected assist rate in the Bundesliga with 0.39 per 90 minutes, behind only Thomas Müller, Serge Gnabry and Christopher Nkunku. Comparing Sancho to United's current options in the right midfield position, we can see the improvement he would be. Jesse Lingard has an expected assist rate of just 0.11 per 90 minutes, whilst Andreas Pereira has 0.22 per 90 minutes, and Juan Mata has 0.25 per 90 minutes, with all these players making a large amount of appearances from the bench, which will skew their numbers positively, whereas Sancho has recorded an XA of 0.39 per 90 minutes, with nearly all those appearances coming from the start. 
Many wingers around Sancho's age have all the hallmarks of a potential world-class player in terms of their dribbling and creativity, but lack the goal-scoring ability to really push into that world-class bracket. This can be seen with someone like Raheem Sterling, who at Liverpool was a fantastic player, being able to dribble past players at will, but his off-the-ball movement and finishing seemed to let him down. When he developed these attributes later on in his City career, he finally became one of the best wide attackers in the world. However, I think Sancho is a lot better than Sterling was at the same age, and I would consider Jadon Sancho a world-class player, even at his young age. He has been consistent with his creative metrics over the past two seasons now, probably being one of the top three best creators in Germany last season and this season, but also having the goal-scoring ability to accompany this. He has scored 14 goals, which is the third most in the league, and two more than he managed in the whole of last season. What's even more impressive is that Sancho has overperformed his expected goals rate by a major 5.78 goals. This may seem like a run of goal scoring form that isn't sustainable. However, last season Sancho also overperformed his expected goals rate, this time by 4.58 goals, showing that Sancho is actually a very good finisher, and that if given chances, he is capable of scoring a high proportion of them. If you'd like me to release a short video analysing the purpose of expected goals as a statistic and how to interpret individual players' expected goals, then like this video and my comment in the comment section below. While in a 4-2-3-1, Sancho would offer the dribbling ability that United have lacked on the right flank. Whilst Rashford will play as an inside forward on the left side, moving in field into positions in behind the opposition's midfield or making runs into centre forward positions, Sancho will play more as a traditional winger, holding his width on the flank. At Dortmund, Sancho has an incredibly effective partnership on the flank with Hakimi. Hakimi is a roadrunner of a right back, using his electric pace to make direct runs ahead of Sancho, which first drags opposition players away from Sancho when covering Hakimi's run, giving him more space, and Hakimi's run gives Sancho the option of playing a through ball in behind the left back. Wambasaka doesn't have the same offensive ability as Hakimi in terms of his dribbling and crossing, but he can provide an overlap for Sancho, which would be the movement needed to draw defenders away from him. However, what I would look to do is have Wambasaka making these overlapping runs on occasion, but play a more reserved role, with Teo Hernandez playing as a more advanced fullback on the left. Sancho can link with Bruno Fernandes and Anthony Martial on the right side, who are both excellent when it comes to playing short first-hand passes in and around the box, and this should give United an added dimension to their attack, allowing them to break down sides who sit deep around their box. Sancho offers United a combination of Daniel James' dribbling and ability to run in behind the back line, and one matters technical and chance creating ability, which shows that he is an obvious improvement. In a 4-4-2 diamond, Sancho could play at the top of the diamond or in the front two as a wide forward. Playing at the top of the diamond, Sancho would be used as a second striker, floating between the lines of the opposition's defence in midfield and looking to make runs ahead of the front two. He certainly have the technical and creative ability to play this role, but this is the position that Bruno Fernandes would likely play, so Sancho also may be used in the front two alongside either Rashford or Martial. Sancho has a pace, dribbling and finishing ability to play this role very well, and would be an improvement on Daniel James, who currently plays this role when Sancho uses a 5-3-2 system. Some may say that Sancho is overpriced at £100 million, however if you look at the alternatives like Ziyech who moved to Chelsea for £40 million, or Nicolas Pepe who moved to Arsenal last summer for £70 million, I would argue that he's great value. This is because Hakim Ziyech is 26 years old and Pepe is 24 years old, whereas Sancho is just 20, which means that paying such a massive transfer fee for him isn't such a massive financial risk as it would be if he was 24 or 25. Sancho is a generational talent on the same level as Matthias de Ligt and Frankie de Jong, so with this opportunity arising for United to sign such a player, it seems to me that even though it would be at huge cost, it could be a masterstroke of a decision in the next few years, as PSG's signing of Kylian Mbappe looks now. Why Manchester United should sign Drews Mertens, the perfect alternative to Anthony Martial, episode 6 of 6. In this episode, I'm first going to analyse why I think Mertens would be a great signing for Manchester United, as well as looking at how the whole team will function with all the signings I have suggested. So Dries Mertens is a relatively outside of the box shout for Manchester United to sign. He is 32, 33 in May, and his current contract with Napoli is due to expire at the end of the season, meaning he would be available to sign on a free. Many would have chosen Timo Werner or Moussa Dembele, however with Martial looking like he's on track to develop into a world-class centre-forward, they don't need a complete replacement. 
As I said in the first episode of my series, I think United need a centre forward who can provide an alternative to Martial. Whilst Martial has excellent moments throughout a game, he can go through periods where he isn't involved in the game, and when United are struggling to link the attack, it may be beneficial for them to have an alternative centre forward who can come on and play more as a deep line forward to solve this issue. However, United shouldn't sign a striker approach in his peak for big money. The Solskjaer will likely use a one-striker system, or a two-striker system with Rashford in the front too, meaning that any striker brought in will be in direct competition with Martial. If United were to sign a player like Werner, he would be competing directly against Martial, which could cause a Frenchman's development to stagnate if he wasn't the first choice forward. Igalo was brought in in January and has scored four goals in eight appearances, which has led to many Manchester United fans calling for him to be signed on a permanent basis. However, he scored against Derby twice in the FA Cup, Club Bruges and Lask in the Europa League, so to say that Igalo has proved his worth is a stretch. Whilst he has done well, Igalo isn't the quality that they need, and both fans and the United board need to be careful that they don't fall into a small club mentality, where they are satisfied with an average player coming in and having a few good performances, leading to them signing him on a permanent basis, only for the inevitable decline to come. Having a veteran like Mertens, who'd be an inexpensive signing, is a perfect solution, as he can provide competition and an alternative to Martial, without pushing him out of the team, as he'd only be signed on a one or two year deal. This is also the same for Mason Greenwood, however he is still very young, so won't be a first team regular starter for United next season. So what sort of player is Dries Mertens, and how good is he? Mertens can play as a centre forward or in any of the attacking midfield positions in behind the striker. As a centre forward he functions best when playing as a false 9, dropping deep from the forward line, trying to get in between the lines of the opposition's midfield and defence from where he can create. This season for Napoli he has created 2.7 key passes per 90 minutes, has an expected assist rate of 0.31 per 90 minutes and despite scoring only 6 goals this season, he has overperformed his expected goals rate by 0.98 goals, with him only making 12 appearances from the start. Last season when Napoli were in a more stable situation, Mertens created 2.8 key passes per 90 minutes, had an expected assist rate of 0.38 per 90 minutes, scoring 16 goals in 35 appearances, with 23 of them being starts, and overperforming his XG rate by 3.62 goals. This shows that Mertens is not only an excellent creator of chances, but also an excellent finisher. Whilst Martial can link the attack well with his hold-up play and his ability to bring the midfield into play is very good, Mertens is a much better creator of chances. This can be seen as Mertens' XA rate of 0.31 per 90 minutes is a lot higher than Martial's 0.12 per 90 minutes. This shows the different type of forwards that Mertens and Martial are. Whilst Martial is a better finisher and has better movement in and around the box, Mertens is a better creator of chances and is better at finding space in between the lines. This gives Solskjaer an alternative option in the attack. In a 4-2-3-1, Dries Mertens could work very effectively with Fernandes in behind him. The Belgian would drop deeper from the forward line than Martial would, dragging a centre-back out of the back line, and therefore opening up space for Rashford and Fernandes to make runs into. Martial's movement is a little different to this. He prefers to position himself high up the pitch and act as a wall that the attackers in behind him can bounce a ball off. If United do face an opposition team that play with a defensive midfielder cutting off the passing lanes into the forward, then it can be hard to progress the attack forward using Martial. In this situation, having a player like Mertens, who can play this sort of Roberto Firmino role, can draw defenders out of position and create space for other United attackers to make runs into, would be invaluable. Mertens could be used alongside Martial, playing in a front two. In a 4-4-2 diamond, he could also be used in behind two forwards, being given the role of moving in between the lines trying to receive the ball, whilst also making runs ahead of the forward line. In this sense, Mertens offers versatility, not just in the positions he can play, but also in what he can offer compared to Rashford and Martial, who are far better when dribbling and making runs in behind the back line, whereas Mertens prefers to receive the ball to feet and being the one to play those through balls for the likes of Martial and Rashford to make runs onto. So with Teo Hernandez, Wilfred Ndidi, Ruben Nevers, Jadon Sancho and Dries Mertens being brought in, what would Solskjaer's United side look like? In a 4-2-3-1, Solskjaer should use an asymmetric back four in possession, pushing Teo Hernandez forward on the left, whilst wan is more conservative with his movements forward, which would play into both wan defensive strengths and Teo's attacking strengths. Ruben Neves and Wilfred Ndidi will both sit in a deep double pivot, 
both are very good ball circulators, with Ndidi being able to play simple passes to move the play forward, whilst Neves has the long passing ability to find players in forward areas, something that United currently lack. McTominay and Fred can also both come into this double pivot when needed. Fred has thrived from playing alongside a ball winning midfielder in the past, such as Taris Stepanenko at Shakhtar and even Matic or McTominay for United. This is because Fred is very good at applying pressure to the opposition's midfield because of his aggression and reading of the game, but lacks a one-on-one -on -one defending ability of a traditional defensive midfielder, so playing him alongside Ndidi in some games would suit his style. Ndidi would be perfect to play on the left of the pivot, as he has defensive assets and a fled system to cover the space in behind Teo, which should give the fullback greater defensive stability to push forward. This is a similar setup to how Klopp uses Jordan Henderson alongside Trent Alexander-Arnold, and like at Liverpool, United's fullback could become their key attacking weapon. These four would give United excellent quality and depth, which is something they have lacked in the past two seasons in the central midfield area. With Ndidi and Neves behind him, Bruno Fernandes can sit higher up the pitch, playing as a more traditional number 10, rather than having to drop deep to help United create from deep areas. Rashford as well should work well with Teo, who will provide the width on the left, allowing Rashford to move infield into positions where he can receive the ball to feet and then dribble at the back line, or make runs in behind them into goal scoring positions. Sancho on the other side will hold his width a lot more, looking to link with the likes of Martial, Fernandes and Wambasaka on the right flank. His interplay and dribbling alone would be an instant improvement on the likes of Mata and Pereira, but with him in the side United would have two top class wide players in Sancho and Rashford. Martial will be United's first choice centre forward and his ability to play short first time passes in and around the box should work perfectly with Fernandes and Sancho, enabling United to play through deep defensive structures. However, Sosha will also have the option of using Mertens in a deep lying forward or force nine role, looking to move into the half spaces, which could be a good option if the opposition are sitting deep and closing off the passing lanes into Martial effectively. With forwards like Martial, Rashford, Sancho, Mertens and Greenwood, Sosha has versatility to move into a two forward system, with all five being able to play as wide forwards or in behind the forward line. Fernandes could play the second striker role, but so could either Mertens or Sancho, which gives Solskjaer the option of playing a more fluid system throughout a match, where the side moves from a wide front three to a narrow one in a diamond shape. In the diamond, a midfield of Ndidi at the base playing as an anchor man, with Neves to his right and Fred to his left, with Fernandes playing at the top, would have the right mix of aggression, tackling ability, creativity and end product in the final third. When you compare this midfield to United's current one, you can see the massive improvement it would be. With Ndidi and Neves also being just 23, this would give United a midfield for the long term, rather than having the likes of Matic in there who is now the wrong side of 30. Solskjaer should also be looking to use Diego Dalot more as an attacking alternative to wan Saka, who can play as a wing back on the right with the Englishman playing in behind him. Twansebi should also be integrated into the starting 11, as he looks like he could be a significant improvement on Lindelof if he develops in the right way. It would be touch and go with players like Chong, Garner and Gomez, who haven't been as impressive as Williams and Greenwood when they've been given the chance. I think it does look like the end of the road at Old Trafford for Chong who is now 20, and I do think Garner and Gomez need to be given loan spells. Greenwood definitely should be given more opportunities from the start, and preferably in central positions, as he does look like he could be the next English star to break out and become a top class player. So thank you for watching, remember to check out the other 5 episodes in the series, and subscribe to the channel and click the bell, because I will be doing this series for other clubs like Real Madrid Barcelona, Arsenal, Tottenham, Chelsea, Liverpool and Manchester City, and any other clubs you want me to do. So put your video ideas in the comment section below.